2021 Committee of the Whole meeting. This is a monthly meeting, usually the first Tuesday of the month, where we as a board are honored to receive presentations and updates and information on a variety of things. And this evening, I'm calling this meeting to order. Again, we are the Duluth ISD 709. This is our monthly Committee of the Whole meeting. Clerk Boswell, will you take roll? Certainly. Member Eater. Present. Member Kirby. Here. Member Lockler Kemp. Here. Chair Lopal. Here. I am here. Member Sandholm. Present. Member Trinka. Here. Superintendent Mays. Here. Assistant Superintendent Bonds. Here. I believe um, Deputy Clerk Erickson is excused. And is, so is um, HR Director Teresa Severn. Yes. And then we got Secretary Paquette. Who's <laughs> waving at me. I'm going to call you out and let you say it. I said it. <laughs> <laughs> I just didn't say it loud enough. I guess not. I just saw your finger. Yeah. At least it was a good finger. <laughs> <laughs> Secretary Jackie Dolan. <laughs> and our student reps are excused. We have a quorum. Thank you, uh, Ms. Roswell, for our robust roll call ideas. We have pretty much three agenda items tonight, board. We are going to hear from a curriculum and instruction. We are also going to um, review the ISD 709 calendar school year. We have a informational item. Um, maybe we don't, maybe? An informational item a presentation from our uh, Scholastica Upward Found, and I was looking, and we have an SRO update and a safe learning plan update from the superintendent. So that's our agenda um, for this evening. I'll turn it over to Assistant Superintendent Bonds. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, and uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, we're going to jump right into it because we have yep. a full agenda, and I know we are uh, want to be cognizant of time. So we do have a presentation uh, this afternoon or this evening um, by our two curriculum coordinators. Uh, Mr. Dale Usselman <laughs> and Mrs. Anna uh, Crockett. And so um, I'm going to turn it over to them and uh, for the viewing audience, uh, we do have it presented here and it's also linked in. Right. Well, hello everyone, it's nice to meet all of you. Yeah, it's nice to meet you too. Thank you. As our yes. new employees, so thank you. Yeah. Um, we are going to go through what is a very lengthy process but it's been in existence and what we did is we took and reviewed and revised it there's a minnesota rule that requires that we review and revise this every six years and it was definitely due for some revision so we're going to highlight the major parts of that revision the full manual and all of the documents that go with it are linked in there um, and of course if we've got questions at the end we're happy to answer those too so the first big piece of this is that we did uh, tweak a bit our review and adoption timeline. There are a few reasons for this. The major reason is that now our timeline aligns with MDE's 10-year uh, review cycle for the standards. So that's important because we want to make sure that as we're coming out with new standards from the State Department, we're then revising our written curriculum and reviewing the materials that we use for in the classrooms to support our written curriculum. Um, this cycle now also allows for, as needed, a, a mid-cycle um, supplementary purchase for materials. Uh, part of the that phase 3B that you can see across there in those rows is just the ongoing implementation and monitoring. And we do often find during that monitoring phase that the data shows that we've got a gap in an area in some, um, for, an, for example, in our elementary levels we've noticed in our reading curriculum some phonics gaps so this would allow for us to say okay our data shows we've got this gap let's review some supplementary materials what else do we need in our classrooms to support our students this also spreads out our content areas so that we're not having multiple major major expenses in the same year you can see we've color coded in green during that phase two those are potential purchasing years uh, each content area has during, during normal non-COVID cycles, two potential purchasing years. This is because sometimes we roll this out in a couple of phases, like science right now is being done in a few steps. Sometimes we do do it all at once and roll it out that way. That's something that the team really will decide as this cycle goes on, and sometimes the standards dictate whether or not we do that. You'll notice that over this next few bunch of years, there are some kind of wonky looking areas, and that's because a few standards implementation years got pushed back due to COVID, so we've got some extended 
phase one or phase two going on, and that will start to even out, hopefully, as the years go on and we don't have to deal with more COVID. Uh, the last major, major thing that happened when we extended these is that we lengthened phase two of the cycle. So very briefly, phase one is the year after we get new standards, we review the new standards, we dig into what are the current research-based best practices as far as the instruction we need to see in our classrooms. We do a needs assessment on the existing curriculum and resources. What do we have that works well? Where are we gonna need to make some changes and fill in some holes? Phase two is a big important phase because this is where we're revising and we're rewriting curriculum with those new standards and we're starting to talk with um, our PD coordinator about staff development that needs to happen as we've got new standards and instructional practices to implement. This is when the teams and committees then also are reviewing materials to support that written curriculum. They'll pilot materials as needed. They'll narrow things down. They'll select them. It's a huge, huge process. So this gives us... Um, the appropriate amount of time in order to complete that process. And then phase 3A is that initial, it's in purple on the calendar, it's that initial required implementation year per MDE. And then 3B, like I said before, is that ongoing implementation and monitoring and collecting data to make sure that what we're doing is working and making changes as needed. Um, the second piece of our work was the procedural guide for curriculum development. This was the piece that was originally created um, and in 2015 was the last time that it went through revision. Um, and so this was the one, it ended up being, I believe, 19 pages. So as Anna was saying, it's quite lengthy. It's linked here. Um, this walks through those phases that Anna was just talking about. Um, and it also provides uh, quite a few resources to um, the curriculum coordinators or the content specialists or the committees that are mentioned in that procedural guide. Um, so I think what we'll do next is we'll just talk about those, those revisions that were made. Yes. So I'm, this is a list of the highlights and then we'll talk a little bit more about a few of these. We have updated committee membership recommendations. We've shifted roles and structures. We've added some positions. We've um, recognized the importance of adding some positions to this committee membership. So you'll see that in there. We, like I was talking about, extended that phase two for curriculum development to allow teams the appropriate amount of time to do that. We updated roles and responsibilities due to the TLE department restructure. We, one major piece that we worked on for a long time was to revise and add some rubrics for curriculum development and materials review. We have added some Minnesota American Indian specific resources to help with curriculum development. And we've also added some support for building principals who are responsible for overseeing implementation with Fidelity. So the first major um, revision was the, um, there is a list in the document of um, suggested uh, committee members, and we added some um, suggestions to that. So some of the suggestions we added was um, diverse student representation. In the previous document, there wasn't a call for students to be part of the process, and we felt very strongly that that's a thing that we should um, make sure is happening. Um, a representative from the social and emotional learning um, crew. Uh, with our new blended learning initiative, we wanted to make sure that a member from the digital innovation team was on the committee. Um, Anna also mentioned we've been working closely with our staff development coordinator, Heather Harvick. Uh, we wanted to make sure she was on those committees as well to help lead with the professional development that would be involved in adopting new curricula. And then um, we also wanted to make sure that our school support staff was also um, at the table when these decisions were being made. I talked about this before, that extension of phase two. So again, it just aligns with those timelines. The biggest piece of this was giving them adequate time to review and write quality curriculum. We were squishing this phase into a year or two before, and that's just not the appropriate amount of time in order to do this piece. It's the biggest bulk of the work here. And then along with that, to ensure the proper review and piloting of potential materials, we spend, we're a big district, we spend a lot of money on materials and we wanna make sure that what we're purchasing is, is good. Um, this was also talked about a little bit. 
um, we updated the roles and responsibilities. A large portion of the um, description of the phases in the procedural guide talk about specific roles and responsibilities. Um, with the restructuring of the teaching, learning, and equity uh, department, there were a lot of updates to be made in this section. So we made sure that the content specialists, their roles um, and responsibilities were outlined. Um, us as the curriculum coordinators, we took on quite a few things to help ease the content specialist load as well as the directors of teaching, learning, and equity. Um, so their responsibilities were also updated. And then we included the staff development coordinator in that process as well. The other probably biggest piece that we worked on, and I would argue also one of the most important, was the revision and addition of some rubrics. We need to have a really solid process that teams use to guide to guide this so that it's based on research and best practice and not just opinions and feelings. So there were a couple in there before that we've just revised and updated. They were six or more years old and they were out of date. Uh, so that would be the ISD 709 curriculum evaluation and design rubric. And this rubric actually serves two purposes. This is to be used as the needs assessment when we review what currently exists. And then when we are rewriting and designing the new written curriculum, that same rubric will guide that process to make sure everything is very well aligned. We also revised and updated the instructional materials evaluation rubric. And this is the rubric that teams will use when they are looking at materials to potentially purchase to, to vet those materials and make sure they meet the criteria and the needs that we've identified in the district. There are also included on um, the next page in the manual a list of content area specific rubrics that exist from uh, national organizations for, for individual content areas. So that if teams would like to dig in even deeper with those content area specific rubrics, they can. But these are the three that every team must use. And then the third one, which is an addition, is the new equity, diversity, and inclusion rubric, which is based on, you can see if you pull this rubric up, you can see the a few rubrics that it's based on. And this one we felt was was really important to support our focus on equity and diversity and inclusion intentionally within our content areas. Intentionality really being the key here, that teams know what to look for, they know what's expected, and all of the materials we purchased are going to support that in our, in our classroom. And I will add to that, to the previous version of this procedural guide had parts and pieces of equity, diversity, and inclusion in the rubric, but we felt like um, we needed to make sure that that was um, more of a conversation than just a couple of check marks on the, um, the other rubric. So we wanted to create its own rubric to make sure that that was um, well thought about. The next thing that we, this was an addition, um, we included some Minnesota American Indian resources. We wanted to, just as Anna was saying about equity, and diversity, we wanted to ensure that there was intentional incorporation of the Minnesota American Indian benchmarks from the state into the curriculum. Um, so there is a list of all of the Minnesota academic standards that are related to Minnesota American Indian tribes. Um, that resource is in there. And then there's also a list of culturally responsive um, curriculum design tools relating to Minnesota American Indian. Right. Then the last piece that we added, this wasn't in there before, were some tools for our building principals as they um, implement these things in their buildings. We, the expectation existed in this document before that they monitor implementation with fidelity, but there weren't any tools to support that. So we felt it was important to add these tools so that they knew what to look for, and then to ensure that continuity and consistency of practices across the district, so we're delivering that guaranteed and viable curriculum to all of our students. This also will enhance the instructional leadership in our buildings. So a piece of work that the, the curriculum writing teams will be responsible for is essentially making a pretty simple checklist for principals to use so that when they go into we're implementing science right now. So when they go into a classroom during science time, they know here are the practices we want to see and here's what we want to see in place as far as the curriculum and the materials being used. So that it's not a guessing game for them as they go in because they cannot know everything about every content area. They're not involved in every single one of these teams. So this way, we're all looking for the same thing. 
That was a quick overview um, of the revision. We expect that there are probably some questions. Uh, it's a lengthy document. Um, so if there are any questions. Yep, and I'm going to open it up and I'm going to caution. We've got 10 minutes on questions today, okay, before we go on. Otherwise, we won't get through this um, and give the rest of the, the people that have come to present. So 10 minutes and I'll first go to Member Trinka and then we'll go to Member Oswald. Member Oswald is first. I think that it's for, as a point of, I don't know what, but I, the, that we're, I, mean, I get that we're trying to cram this in so that people can go to concerts. I totally understand that. No, but that's not, that's not okay. th right. generally the reason. What I'm trying to do is, is get us through all because we, we also have a, a safe learning. And I just, I just think that this is certainly, we just all got the document that has a curriculum and I'm seeing everybody write all this stuff and we can invite them back. This is a huge, a huge topic. And I'm so appreciative that we're getting a glimpse of it now. Curriculum, if you're gonna say anything about our values in, in our budget, it's curriculum. So I really see that we, we've done a lot and I know we have questions. So, you know, we'll keep going. But Member Oswald then and then Member Trinko. That being said, is there a reason why we'd have to approve this? At the coming board meeting? No, no, this no, is information. No, so this is just presentation, and, and they can come. part of the consent agenda, so I'm just curious how that works. It's it's really that's that's kind of leftover, you know, verbiage okay. from the way that the model of this of our of our board book is put up. So okay. yeah, 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 yeah. Good point. Okay. So member Oswald and then member Trinka. Okay, I will be quick and brief. I I'll try. <laughs> um, does the world languages curriculum timeline include the immersion program? Yes. <laughs> that the the immersion program is different, obviously, because it's a little more complicated. Being it's not just the classes, and I will be totally honest, I cannot answer this question as well as Crystal could answer this question, and she's just not here right now. And you have a little more experience with immersion, so I don't know if you want to. But our immersion programs are teaching um, are teaching the content that the other classes are teaching, just in the language. Um, so there, when math is reviewed, that includes materials that go into our immersion classrooms. Um, we were just there the other day and we were talking about in the Spanish immersion program, this is a little simpler because a lot of our materials at that level do come, the Spanish version comes. In Masabicon, they've got the added task of translating and, um, but they don't, please correct me if I'm wrong, if you know, they don't have like a Spanish textbook like the high school classes would have for the Spanish language. They're simply speaking in Spanish all day long. So the structure of the, lang the language learning at that level is a little different than it is at the high school level. Correct. Yes. correct. And there's a, we also have a coordinator position and that coordinator uh, working with staff is responsible for the development of the curriculum for Ojibwe uh, language and that's how it's accomplished there. But you are correct, it, it's not, um, evident here and that's something that we will um, take under consideration as we, we move forward. Thank you. I, I, and I, I've asked the question in recognition that Ojibwe is, is taught differently than, than just, you know, from a textbook. Um, you know, there's storytelling, there's, there's cultural concepts that aren't included in, in other means of, of learning. So I, that I was really concerned about that. And, and I also do know that you know the content is going to be developed and and you know it'll it'll complete itself eventually you know k k five at least and you know will be able to be reused but when will it get renewed and that sort of thing too so and that's why i look at the curriculum renewal process um so and oh sure could I, yeah so just to give a little bit more information so as anna was saying now that i'm understanding the question um so the, the instructional resources that um, those programs use are ordered um, along with the other. So um, for example, the Spanish program, they use the Wonders curriculum, just like um, the others. And then um, yeah, Ms. Abekong, they also get a budget to be able to um, renew that what they use. Lots of times what they'll do is they'll use the same instructional materials as um, the, the English students, but they'll do the translating. So they'll use the same thing, um, just translate it. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and then um, how do you plan on including um, cultural 
on equitable representation from the community in your recommendations on who should be on the committee because I see that as, as missing at this point and so I, I'd like to know if I'm missing it necessarily. I know, you know, with the um, evaluation that you have the, the um, what, what you, whatever you call it, the, the, the equity, the, the form that yep. you that you created, yeah. um, I, I don't view that necessarily as, as equitable because it's still a majority of Caucasian and white people checking off and, and judging whether a cultural or equitable um, something is happening. And so how is there a plan or is that just something that's missing and has to be developed? So, and again, jump in if you want to jump in. When these committees are put together, our content specialists really take the lead on putting together the committee for their content area. We support them in that. Um, part of the answer to your question is that when we're talking with a content specialist about forming a committee, part of the conversation has to be, this needs to be a diverse committee. And so it's, as we're forming this team, it's our, it's our responsibility to make sure that we're um, finding that diversity for the team. We do have, and it's included toward the end, um, when we're recruiting district staff members for the committee, we do have now, it's an application process really, which will help to diversify that some within the staff. But as far as recruiting those, those community members, it really is just making that concerted effort to ensure that it's not a homogenous group of people and we've got diverse voices. So that when we're going through things like the EDI rubric, we've got those diverse voices at the table because of exactly what you said. And, and I just didn't see community members on there beyond the students. Um, for actually, if you look under where it says curriculum, curriculum advisory committee on page three. Just okay. um, click on the uh, document and it'll pop up. Sure. It is the last page. It is appendix H. And on appendix H, you will see the roles of the committee. And on there, there are two uh, places for community members. They, we also have parent representation, or representatives, that is. And so, I haven't had a chance to read the oh, okay. end of that document. So, it, so on this document, oh, appendix for, uh, yeah. H thank you for identifies yeah. the roles, and we do have two community members. But to your point, you know, that's one of the things that, as you can tell, that's why even during this presentation, you heard uh, an intentional focus on equity and diversity, making sure that we have a rubric that um, uh, calls for committees to really uh, assess um, the diversity of, of the the materials for uh, the cultural responsiveness. So all of those things are happening. And so we're gonna make sure, one of the charges that we're doing is to make sure that all of our committees are diverse in scope. So to your point, we need to make sure that we don't lose sight of these community members not being individuals who don't reflect uh, the community. Thank you. And, that and just know I, I, I appreciate that because yeah. that's what I look for, so. Yeah. <laughs> Member Trinka. Yeah, thank Member you. Trinka who? I have a quick question. Peter and then Ralph would like. I will um, email the rest of my questions to Assistant Superintendent Bond. Is that, oh, is that right? Okay, Good. great. And so, if you could share that with all of us, that would be great. And then invite these people back as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, so the question, I, I really appreciate all the information <coughs> that you've provided and all the work that you're putting into this. I, uh, like Member Oswald, am really appreciative of the work that's happening around inclusivity for curriculum development. So with that being said, and I think this is a question for you, Assistant Superintendent Bonds, how does our uh, like remediation plan with MDE around our American Indian students fit into the curriculum development process? Mm -hmm. So any of the feedback, and you're talking about the concurrence and non-concurrence. Yes. So you. the concurrence and non-concurrence, not only does it focus on uh, curriculum, but it also focuses on other areas mm -hmm. related to uh, yep. American Indian. Uh, families and students. So this is one aspect and, and this um, addresses some of the concerns they have uh, in that area which is making sure the American Indian standards are embedded in the curriculum and this process that has been identified uh, has been developed now uh, makes it really intentional that those uh, the American Indian standards are considered uh, through the process so it's it's embedded. So some of their concerns uh, some of the concerns have been brought up uh, through the concurrence and non-concurrence mm -hmm. um, that was one of the things that was identified. Yep. And so this is how we're assuring that it's being discussed in the development of 
uh, in the development and the adoption of new curriculum. So it's it's been addressed through the the processes and in a, in a systematic way. Sure. Okay. And not even just with the curriculum, but with things like our Native American students reading at a lower grade level mm -hmm. than other students. Like just making sure that there's cross pollination, so we can make some hopefully get to the point where we don't have to have that. Um, Notice of non concurrence. Thank you. Yeah, and let me address that because that's a great. That was a. I'm glad you brought that up because that's a great question. Because at the very begin, one of the beginning um, steps to all of this is to actually review data. So we we review all of our student data and, and we see the discrepancies that exist and we see obviously the strengths that exist and and all that information is used to make decisions on you know where are our gaps you know which. Um, of our student groups are not experiencing success or which ones are having success and all those things are factored in as we as teams because I'm saying we because I've been <laughs> part of a lot of the teams and adopted uh, many a curriculum and so it's um, it's things that are considered up front and, and that is something that um, will ensure that we are attending to all of our students uh, and, and the challenges and make sure we adopt the curriculum that we think we're going to have the most success with all students, but especially students who have um, desperate outcomes. Thank you. Um, I'm thrilled to see the addition of a digital innovation committee member. That's a great idea. We know that um, pedagogy is going to shift. We're getting more online. We're getting more digital because learning is going to take place out of the classroom and in the classroom. Um, the other question I have, just to straighten this out in my mind, when we're talking about this curriculum review cycle, so is that... Am I reading this correctly? Every 16 years, we're reviewing the curriculum for science. Mm -hmm. Can you just no. help me? Like, <laughs> <laughs> it's every 10. That's an That's area still horrible, that looks but okay. not weird that we have because that. of COVID. Yeah. yeah, it won't. It will not be more than 10. Okay, so every 10 years, we're we're essentially buying resources and curriculum to support science in K through 12. Yes. Okay. Yes. And then math. Am I misreading math? Is that what? Why does it say? 20 current standards implemented is 2011 and the new scheduled review phase 2031 to so there's a couple I, sh I should have highlighted this earlier because this does look really weird we have to go over this with our content specialist yeah too. so if it is an area that is in the middle of getting new standards right now okay we are still teaching the old standards um, but we're about to get these new standards, but we haven't implemented them yet. So okay. math is being rewritten this year at right. the state okay. level. That's so um, that's why the next the next phase looks like it's like 20 years from the Okay, so it's the 10-year standards, right but we work sort of in the middle, so yeah. it looks like this super long. Okay, yep. all right, thank you. You're welcome. Remember last question? Yeah. Great, thank you, Anna and Dale. I look forward to you coming to uh, continue to mm -hmm. uh, present to us, so thank you. Um, two things. One is on the curriculum review and development cycle timeline, and thank you for providing that. Um, it, it mentions the state statute 120B, and so that's the state statute that refers to um, all of these areas of curriculum review, right? So, okay, great. So we can dig deeper in that if we're interested. I appreciated that uh, you had the slide about the rubrics and um, that you uh, had it embedded so we could uh, dig deeper into that as well. So, so thank you for that. Okay, you're welcome. Thank you. Member Sandholm, and then I just have one quick question. Um, do we have any idea when we've reviewed this process? The last time we reviewed this curriculum and development review process, I mean, we don't, we don't have a dated document on the, the previous one to this one. 2015. 2015. Okay, thank you. So I do want to uh, take the opportunity to thank uh, Anna and, and Dale for all of their work. Um, as you see, even during um, you know trying times and the pandemic, we have teams who are you know working diligently, you know moving forward all of our uh, curriculum instruction areas and, and making the significant uh, structural changes and, and systematic changes uh, that we need to move the district forward. So I want to thank them uh, publicly for all their work, and I know they worked with. A number of our content area teams and other individuals who played a role. So, so thank you for everything you do. I too would like to thank you um, on behalf of, of us as a as a district. I think the curriculum and instruction are, are two mm -hmm. core areas of what we do, and uh, really appreciate the the forethought with things like 
taking more time to to actually investigate what we're putting in place rather than making a quick decision, as well as the uh, many points about uh, inclusivity that have been mentioned by other board members. Uh, really appreciate it, and uh, thank you, Mr. Bonds. I know that we worked together, you know, five five years ago on curriculum development ourselves in in another district, and and seeing the work being done here in such a cohesive, thoughtful way is very inspiring. Thank you. And again, I just want to thank the board and, and um, really put forward that many of us, I think, now are on the board for the next two to four years, and I'm excited about curriculum instruction and the structure that our leaders have decided to put in with the direction of Jan and Brenda. And just um, one of the things Paul and I maybe have seen in our district over the years that we've served here is when budgets get tight, we tend to shortchange curriculum, and that has really been... Um, frustrating for many staff and the leaders and so when we continue to see achievement gap and we continue to see low graduation rates and we continue to see our struggles um, part of that is is that we, we've needed a robust um, structure support and we can't keep cutting our content specialists either which is another thing we've we've tended to have to do so I'm delighted that as we set our budgets going forward in the next years that we have been together now for a while and we know the needs of our district. So I really appreciate the presentation. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, and, I, and I would be, and I would be remiss. I'm glad you uh, shared that, uh, Chair Lopold, because I, I do uh, think about that, uh, Member Derek Eater. When you say 10 years, you're right. In, in most situations, it's usually a four to six year uh, curriculum cycle process. Um, that occurs in 10 years is um, a long time to be waiting. And as many of you know, we have a lot of our resources that uh, need replacement and updating, but we also know that it uh, requires significant resources to do so. So as we move forward, uh, prioritizing, you know, critical materials and, and so forth will be something that will definitely be uh, a topic of discussion and consideration. Just as a housekeeping note, I wanted to note that I had gone through my slide pre presentation on the safe learning plan. And so if there are additional questions when we come to that agenda item, I welcome those. But that, that presentation has been shared. As, oh, okay. As okay, we, so uh, you, do, you don't have any other updates on the safe learning plan? Only if there are particular okay. questions, okay. but okay. I'm glad to update okay. on anything that, that the board would have. Within. And are those, is that for later? Yep. Yeah. Okay. So, Yep, so are we next on to the calendar, yep, calendar committee? And you've got a copy of that in board book as well. Please and go. this does look like it will move to the agenda on a school board night to approve? Yes, that okay. is correct. So item, um, you know, 3A1B2, um, <laughs> <laughs> you have in front of you the proposed calendar for the 22-23 school year. And you will see that it looks very similar to um, the last uh, several calendars. Um, that have been adopted by the school board. And um, so I think many of you are pretty familiar with how uh, it reads. And so I'll take any questions um, at this point in time. And as indicated, we there was a subcommittee uh, working with um, our labor manager process to uh, review and discuss and come to an agreement on this is the calendar uh, that has been agreed upon. And I believe the first hand was Ms. Trinka and then Ms. Oswald. I was yeah. first last time. Uh, okay. I, I think she, her hand was up first. But, um, so just as a reminder, this is just for the calendar year. It's not like for all the holidays that administration staff have and things like that. Like This is for our families to yes, see and there's yeah. another calendar for staff. Yeah. Right. Okay. Just making sure because there are some things that were represented. Um, what I... Yes, we've done this process every year. We have not done it at a time when we haven't had um, secured contracts. So if we approve this next week, is there a caveat or like w will the board go back and revisit the calendar um, in the event that days get added or taken away or our... Mm -hmm. So I would say yes, that, that if... Uh... If, if there is a change, like let's just say through the negotiation process, there are additional professional development days added or something changed or in, in that manner, uh, it would be something that we'd bring back to the board for, for uh, change or consideration of change. Thank you. 
she took the words right out of my mouth. Yeah. <laughs> um, just say, but I also just wanted to add a comment about um, the the definite lack of professional development days. Even though I know they're, it's all contractual. It, I just want to reiterate that everybody knows that the teachers beg for more teacher development. Paraprofessionals beg to be included in teacher development. Um, and so I really hope before, whenever it is I'm done on this board, that we have more than the, the very few days on here to help our teachers learn and become better at the profession because they want to. <laughs> and I, I certainly hope that that is something that materializes before I'm done. Appreciate it. Member Raffelkamp. Yep, thank you. I uh, was just telling a parent in our district today that I served on this committee uh, years ago as a parent when we started the February week-long break. I was on the committee that year. So, but um, I had two questions. One is, um, had, has there ever been any, any consideration, and this did come from some parents, uh, with the December break that it would be a full two weeks um, rather than uh, what it's been the last few years. So one, did that come up in your conversation? Uh, and then secondly, um, um, what was my second thing? Um, oh, uh, and either of you could answer this. Could you just review, uh, particularly for the public, how many days that we, by state statute, are required to uh, be in school for instructional days and just kind of how that fits into the thinking of the calendar. Okay. The second one will quickly pull up because it's, I think it's best if we address that through the number of hours. Mm -hmm. And so if you can quickly <laughs> pull up the, the, the document that has a number of hours um, while I address the first one. The first one um, has to do with consideration. Mm -hmm. um, the committee considered lots of um, mm -hmm. options. You know, there were uh, various calendars presented to the committee that included um, a, a different way of separating the professional development days that we do have and, and, and spreading them out throughout the year. Uh, there was consideration for half day opportunities or excuse me, early release opportunities or late start opportunities. So there were a lot of discussions related to a number of ideas, um, but ultimately we landed with uh, the calendar that's presented here. Say more. <laughs> <laughs> and was there ever consideration for the full two weeks at, uh, uh, at during the holiday? Yes, there was consideration for that. Then there was other ideas around um, where the holiday, or excuse me, where the spring break would land or not land. So there was a lot of uh, ideas about you know how to um, either collapse them or expand them. But ultimately, this is where we're landed. Mm -hmm. it, 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 so the um, minutes and hours, and it's hours here in, in uh, Minnesota, some, some places it comes down to, to minutes as opposed to hours. The, uh, the hours required are 350 for voluntary pre-kindergarten, 425 for half-day kindergarten, uh, 850 for full-day kindergarten, um, 300, or I'm sorry, 935 for grades one through six, and 1,020 hours for grades uh, seven through 12. Right now, we are very close uh, with our secondary schools to the minimum number of hours, which is part of the reason why you know, we're, there's interest in potentially, uh, you know, expanding that. Uh, but then also, when you mentioned the the winter holiday and expanding that to two weeks, that would probably require a shift of some of the other days back into the, the winter holiday because of the um, the closeness with where we're at with our, our minimum number of hours. So those are the minimum number of hours. And then there are additional uh, commentary on, on uh, first, you know, first day of school, last day of school, Labor Day start date. Uh, all schools must finish this school year by the end of, by June 30th. Those are some of the other factors that go into to that uh, calculation. And as a follow-up, how does that compare to other districts in our area in terms of hours? Well, we I would say that we do have a uh, our our calendar is is one of the 
the shorter calendars in the area, and I would say that our, our length of day for our, for our students, particularly in secondary, is uh, shorter than the average by quite a bit. And we have done some comparative work of, of some of the other districts, and, and it is a shorter day than, than uh, many. Thank you, Navarita. Um, this isn't the time for it right now because we have a lot of other things that we're negotiating mm -hmm. or through, but I, I think, you know, somewhere in the near future, I think it would be a good time to go back Maybe this is something strategic planning, but to go back to the um, community members within the district, like the teachers, the staff, and then the families too, and start thinking about building a calendar together. Having mm -hmm. to, I realize that we have contractual obligations and mm -hmm. stuff, but I think it would be a good idea um, to maybe think about re-envisioning what our calendar looks like. I agree. Because I do know the, the February, the April, all these things sort of um, in the calendar, I know that our community has a lot of opinions about. So, if we, at some time, I'm, right, I would very, is, very much welcome that. Yeah. And I think that your your mention about uh, professional development time mm -hmm. and the the desire for that that is something uh, that that we as an administration would like to see too. And and I probably can't can't comment too much just because we're in the midst of negotiations. Yeah, exactly. But I I think that there's a um, shared understanding that with the steep learning curve that we have for, for staff and students that we uh, consider what we can do to add professional learning. And I, I agree as well that when we think about other other bargaining units and, and needs of other staff members, um, considering through negotiation, uh, contract negotiation, what can we do to add days of professional learning for bus drivers and paras and mm -hmm. clerical and others, uh, it's important because this is, it, this is a changing organization changing industry and, and definitely uh, very quickly changing and with with everything that we have moving forward it's important for us to, to honor and value the professional learning time of our the adults within the system as well totally agree and then also that um, that piece of families having the opportunity mm -hmm. to have commentary and and, and mm -hmm. input into right. what the calendar looks like I think it's and also is is as, as uh, I think that would entail it, ensuring that it's diverse community input because sometimes calendar choices are linked more firmly in, in uh, longer standing traditional calendar and, and I want to make sure that that, uh, that there's there's ample consideration of, of uh, you know breadth of different holidays and things like that within yeah, our calendar which I as think well. is what gathering that community input mm -hmm. would allow us to agree very much anybody else just in the talk about being, you know, so close to the minimum number of hours that our students get of education, it, it's really hard for me to swallow that we're we're at the minimum, and yet we're always looking around asking how can we increase in our enrollment, how can we attract more students here, and when you say to the community, <laughs> you know, that you're going to get the least amount of hours you know, by state law of learning, that's not helpful. And so I really believe that, you know, if we're really going to attack our, our, our learning gaps and our racial gaps and every gap there is and benefit our community, that that's something that needs to be addressed. And I really hope that teachers can understand that that and paraprofessionals can all staff can understand that because we all were working so hard for our kids right now and to be you know having to make decisions of, of can we give you two days off but you know can we get away with that because we don't you know we're already at the minimum number of hours. that shouldn't even be a part of the discussion we should be able to to do that for our staff and thank goodness mba saw that that's possible and, and agreed with us but yet we need to have that buffer to do that, to serve our students and to help them learn. And I'm sorry, I'm passionate about this, <laughs> especially because we, we as a board get criticized about the lack of enrollment and kids leaving the district. And, and we're always trying to say all the best things that are going on because we do so many wonderful things, but we could do them so much better if we have more time to do them. I'll just leave it at that. Yeah, thank you. I guess to uh, piggyback on Member Oswald's comments and, and the, the numbers that you gave us that are state requirements, where are we when it comes to these hours uh, across the board? I, I looked this 
focus on the two, the, uh, the one through six and the seven through 12. Mm -hmm. how, how far off are we from that minimum state requirement? I don't have the, the exact number in my mind right now, uh, but, but it's very close at secondary. We're almost to the equal to the number of hours. Okay. Yeah, so, we, so if we have a snow day or if we have a cancellation, it puts us below the number of hours. And I think historically, um, there hasn't been as much effort to make up make up snow days and things like that. And I think that that's something that, that is uh, going to need to change. Um, I think this year is a, hard, a year of hardship, and I think that there's a difference in our understanding. But I think that, um, I guess I'm, I'm <laughs> I'm used to systems where you have to make up all the minutes and all the hours if you if you uh -huh. um, if you are, are under, and I think that it's important for us to to consider that. And also, I think that there are some some exceptions that can be made uh, through some some districts will will have inclement weather opportunity for uh, for uh, remote instruction, mm -hmm. and so I think that those are things that we need to consider as well. That that uh, but again, I want to be. A little cautious about going too deep into some of the subjects because I, I don't want to get into uh, well, in past discussions, negotiations. In, right? in past discussions, I think we've heard and, and we've learned that it, it isn't an issue for K or, or one through six. Mm -hmm. um, their Secondary. their school days um, is a, a couple snow days doesn't impact them hitting meeting that hour requirement where it does mm -hmm. at the secondary level. So mm -hmm. the, the, our our district wide problem is is more or less. Agreed. Snow days and um, other days that impact or where they lose time uh, at the 7 through 12 level. And, and we do have the exact minutes uh, and hours for our school district. I'm feverishly over here trying to find it. I just I'll ask the board um, if you allow me give me the opportunity. I'll make sure I have that information at the ready at the board meeting. And again, I'm allowing more conversation on this because this is a voting. Uh, this is a voting thing for us at the next board meeting. And so please feel free to ask more questions. We could have spent a lot of time on curriculum. We love it. It was good stuff. It was. So we're going to invite them back. Yep. But Member Eater. I would just um, maybe caution our language a little bit. We have arrived to the number of hours in K through 6, or K through 5 and 6 through 12, both through boards of the past voting on those contracts and voting on those calendars this isn't just a teacher and a para and all this like there's two sides to this that have to take responsibility for exactly what the calendar looks like and for the exact number of hours and it's going to take two sides to come back and figure out how we address learn opportunity gaps how we figure out to get our graduation rates but this is this is a collective this is all of us working together pulling in the same direction not not going at each other so i would just caution our language when we talk about how we arrive to the number of hours through for our six through 12 for our secondary. And I would just add a little bit onto that too, just a couple of things, going back to member Lothar Kemp's, um, you know, kind of question about the December holiday break is that I, I, I thought, you know, and you probably have a background on this, when we gave the February um, opportunity there, it was, I thought, a kind of a collaborative decision to take less away from the holiday to give us the February break week because that seemed to just be something that we thought um, giving breaks every six to eight weeks seemed to rejuvenate mm -hmm. staff and students to, to make it through a long winter. So that would be my recollection to that. And then just, um, I'm just kind of, in a way, the, the hours and all of that is interesting. I'm, I'll be looking forward to, for the information, but it still seems this is a pretty traditional calendar, one that I've worked with under, you know, the 30 some years I've been in the district with the days off and where they're placed. We still are working a quarter to eight to a quarter to four hourly. So, so that has not changed in, in my whole career. I, I would think where we're coming is how we've structured the minutes within our workday. And that's a negotiation and a, and a contractual and, and two. So it's not like we're changing the work day, we're changing how we use or, or we're asking how we can better use minutes, right? Or not. That 120 hours, 7 through 12, counts instructional hours, not necessarily the quarter to eight to quarter to four. That's that, is, that is correct. What um, Superintendent uh, identified were the minimum 
a number of instructional Instruct hours, hours. Okay. that is expected, but the number of work hours and the amount the of time that students are in the building, the staff are in the building, uh, differs. So, and, and so we can make sure we provide some, some more clarity on that as well, um, if, if that's desired uh, by the board. One of the things that um, I, and we just participated in is a some training with the Bureau of Mediation Services, uh, uh, the DFT and the administration. And so that's something that we were really excited about because it, it, is, it has given us an opportunity to, again, um, discuss um, how um, administration and um, uh, labor can work more effectively together and, and, and have greater communication and and so forth. So I, I'm optimistic that it's open up, it will open up the door for some additional conversations uh, as a result of, of this. And, and hopefully, uh, moving forward, we will be able to um, consider some other opportunities by having some deeper conversations with them and, and coming to some agreements on, on different topics such as this one. And then the last thing I, I do want to say is this year and uh, next year, we have used some of our ESRA dollars to provide um, our uh, paras and others with professional development. So many of them uh, were invited and were uh, had the opportunity to, to uh, receive professional development this year and we use our ESSER dollars to uh, support that training and we're going to continue to do so as long as we have um, resources available to do so. I just, uh, the last thing I'd say about the calendar is uh, thank you, uh, Member Lofo, for kind of highlighting a little bit of past perspective. And, and I just wanted to say, when I served on that committee, it was as a parent, uh, and there were many parents on the committee at the time and from across the district. And, and that February break actually did stem out of community support. So uh, I'd be glad to share more history if you wanted. But uh, thank you again uh, for all the work. I know a lot of work goes into this committee, so. And we, I'm sure the district appreciates, family appreciates that we put out a, a proposal for a calendar mm -hmm. here in, in December. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's a that was the goal. Any other? Okay, moving along to our next item, which is the College of St. Scholastica's Upward Bound. Is that right? That is correct. And program coordinators here. Hi, thank you so much. Um, Michelle, can I yes. start? Is it okay if you stand yep. here? Yep. You want to stand? Yeah. Standing is fine. If that's okay for everybody. Yeah. Over your chairs yeah. for those who want to sit. Yeah. Um, I just want to thank you first of all for the time. We really do appreciate um, the opportunity to come in and introduce and tell you a little bit about the three trio programs that are hosted by the College of Saint Scholastica. There's Talent Search, Upper Bound, and Upper Bound Math Science. So tonight gives us an opportunity to tell you a little bit about each one of those and kind of give you some background on some of the services that we provide. My name is Kirsten Walker, and I am the director of the TRIO Talent Search Program, and I'm also the advisor at Denfeld High School. Um, with me tonight is Lisa LaCour, who is the advisor to the Lincoln Park Middle School students for our program. So I'll tell you a little bit about Talent Search. Um, TRIO Talent Search is provided to the Duluth School District, like all the other TRIO programs, through a grant through the Department of Education. Um, the College of St. Scholastica's Talent Search Program was established in 1998 and we've been serving the Duluth School District since that point. Um, this year, in August of 2021, we were just awarded another five-year grant cycle and we'll be able to serve our students through 2026 at this point already. Um, our students or our target schools for TRIO Talent Search are Denfeld High School and Lincoln Park Middle School. Besides those two school districts here in Duluth, we also do serve Cloquet Middle and High School, we serve Cromwell Wright School District, and we serve the Floodwood School District. Um, the College of St. Scholastica's TRIO Talent Search, often referred to as the TS program by our students and our participants, is a pre-college educational opportunity outreach program that helped motivate and support 564 students in sixth grade through 12th grade at six of our middle and area high schools. We help support them as they pursue completion of high school and then continuation into and completion of post-secondary education. So Talent Search, we help students starting in sixth grade successfully navigate through the middle school, high school, 
and then on to post-secondary institution of their choice. This can be a certificate, it can be a diploma, it can be associates, a bachelor's degree, it can be a two-year public, private. We help them navigate whatever avenue that they're hoping to pursue after high school. Um, TRIO programs, like all of our TRIO programs, are here to help students overcome class, social, and cultural barriers to higher education and attainment of that. I'm going to pass on to Lisa to tell you a little bit about some of our services briefly. So Talent Search provides information about academic planning and study skills, college exploration. We take students on campus visits, career pathways, like career inventories and career fairs, college admission requirements. Um, we have a college knowledge month and application days at our high school. Scholarship opportunities, financial literacy, and student financial aid programs, including FAFSA completion night for our families. The total number of Duluth students served at Lincoln Park Middle School and Benfeld High School since 1998 is over 3,000. The total number of Lincoln Park Middle School students this year is 110, over 110. And then the total number of Benfeld High School students is over 90. Um, a little bit at the bottom here is we're federally funded grants. We have certain ob objectives and benchmarks that we have to meet each year. Um, since 1998, we have met or exceeded all of our objectives that we have had to attain. And the last reporting period was 1920. We're still gathering. We have not reported on the 2021 school year. But in the 1920 um, objectives, we had 99% of our participants who completed their grade level and moved on to the next grade level successfully. And this is through our entire target schools, so all of um, all six of our programs. 96% of our seniors graduated, and of those 96, 62% of our students graduated with a rigorous curriculum program, um, preparing them for college entrance. We had 80% of our graduating participants enroll in an institution of higher education. Again, two-year, four-year, um, in-state, out-of-state. We had lots of different locations that our students went to. And 55% of our participants completed a program of post-secondary education within six years. So not only are they enrolling, but they are graduating and attaining that certificate, diploma, or degree that they are pursuing. I'm going to hand off to our colleagues um, with the Upper Bound and the Upper Bound Math Program. Hi, I'm Amy Glarwitz. I work at the College of St. Scholastica, Director of Upper Bound and Upper Bound Math Science. We are very similar to what Talent Search does, except we work solely with the 9th through 12th grade population. I'm going to let these two introduce themselves. And I'm Steph Sklores, and I am the Assistant Director and Program Coordinator, and I have been with Upper Bound for 27 years, Ooh. and I think I've learned with Nicole Hall. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so. I'm Brittany Simons, uh, previously Brittany Tegg, so you can see the name, same person, uh, just different name. Uh, and I am the advisor here at Denfeld as well as Renshaw, and I'm also the um, career coordinator for work study uh, for Upper Bound and Upper Bound Math Science. So as, as Kirsten mentioned, um, we are all college prep programs, college preparatory programs. Our, Focus is a little different because she starts with 6th through 12th graders and we start with, uh, we work with 9th through 12th. Um, we have different methods of our delivery, so we actually meet with our students every week and then we have them on campus once a month and then we have them here in Duluth at uh, St. Scholastica for six weeks during the summer. So they are living and learning in our environment. So it's a pretty cool opportunity for those. Um, we serve 138 between both programs. I should have mentioned that. 59 of math science, 79 with Upward bound. Yeah. So um, thank you for having us. You're probably wondering, like, why now? I mean, if I've been doing this for 27 years, this is the first time I've actually been in front of the Duluth School Board. Shame on me. Um, <laughs> Shame but on Shame yeah, on I mean, it's an, I think it's important for us to be able to share what we do and, and what we do, and we're working with your students and the successes that we have. And we have doctors, lawyers, chiropractors, um, and I've just had the opportunity all these years to be. Um, in connection with Ms. Wolfall. So thank you for the, getting us in here and, and doing that and being such a huge advocate for our program. And I've been in her classroom many a times presenting. Um, and so we have a short little video. Mr. Smith is, is it you Mr. Smith? I am. Oh, thank you. Nice meeting you. <laughs> <laughs> Technology is not my thing, so thank you so much. <laughs> And if I had to choose three words to describe my design experience, my three words to describe my design experience would be 
and I have a bad experience. And if I had three words to describe Alfred Brown. And three words I had to describe the experience of Alfred Brown in general. Three words to describe my experience. My three words to describe my Alfred Brown experience are entertaining, different, life changing, innovative, extremely outgoing, educational, slick, exciting, helpful, informative, amazing, it's great, <laughs> exciting, and laughter, committed. And I would describe the whole program, UB and the UBM, as, as my family, uh, my second family. Because um, they will let you in with open arms no matter what. Um, they'll give you your opportunities, they'll give you everything you need to continue your college experience and to stay on track in your high school career. Like I said, they are a family. Family is a huge thing. Um, family. Because Upper Brown is honestly my second family. Like, I. So you can tell there was a common theme in the whole whole thing and we didn't even we just asked them to do this and it's family and I think that's been the most important part that's been our intentionality of making sure that we have built a culture of acceptance that all students are welcome and that we've given them this platform so they can have this voice and their voices can be heard. They can lead when maybe they don't get to lead at their schools and they can lead in a smaller setting. And like I said, you'll see some of these successes up here. Um, family is what we want and we want to be their constant in their life. We want to be there to advocate for them, to, to know that we are always in their corner fighting for them, to, to figure out what their story is and to be able to tell their story and the importance of their story and what they need to do to find that success. And I think that's been the part of the culture that we have built with Upper Bound and family really is what we drive home because we want them to know that they can be them true, their true self, be authentic and genuine. And I think that's been really rewarding and there's been so many successes um, and Brittany was going to point out two of them. I heard Miss Lopal mention Maddie <laughs> in there. Yes. So I, I am, you know, I'm going to take some stuff here, but uh, I also want to point out, like, it's all of us standing here right now, you know, we represent a program that's for low income first generation students, and we represent them not just because it's our job, but we all are LISD, is what we call it. We all are from low-income first-generation students. We are the first people in our families to go to college and kind of get out of that cycle. And so we live it, we breathe it, we, we understand that struggle that we like to call. And so we're, we're here for these kids for more than the job. It's, it's a personal reason. And uh, yeah, as you can see, Maddie, Maddie Henderman was in there, <laughs> student of mine, and as well as uh, Ariana St. Germain. Uh, also mm -hmm. student mine here from Denzel, but uh, those girls, they have, they're going to do great things. Um, Maddie, Maddie's at Scholastica for free. I mean, yes. she's going to college yeah. for free. Yeah. Ariana St. Germain is at Augsburg. And I mean, those two and the rest in the video, I mean, yeah. they're going on to do great things and they're going to change the world. And um, and what a better, I mean, I think as, as Duluth District and as Duluth Dental, I mean, so proud. So we should be very proud of them and we have, um, and we're, and we're very proud of them. So thank you for allowing us to talk. And this year we are in the process of writing our grant. We have been funded. I've been through a couple grant cycles in my time at the college, uh, along with office space, but that's a whole different story. <laughs> um, so um, I am confident that uh, we, will, we will be funded again, um, but I know that there are things that we ask as, as a program and what we want from the district and of course, um, we, you've been on it. You already wrote your letter. We're on it. I mean, we have the support, and which has been really nice, and, and it just let our support supporting us and what we do. And, and the nice thing with all of our programs is that we cover a, a lot of students. So there should not be students. UMD has an upper bound program. Mm -hmm. There should not be students left behind. We're not competing for students. Mm -hmm. Um, there's plenty of students out there that can use our help. That's the best part about it. With, a, with our ground, we should be able to cover a large population of students. And we're happy to uh, help out your guidance counselors. I know that they are over, overloaded with students, so we can step in and help with some of those things. Um, Kristen had mentioned FABDA, and I think Lisa talked about that too. College acceptance, college campus visits, those kinds of things. Um, 
and Steph was talking about all the stuff we need for our grant. We are writing right now. So that could be a little stressful. Uh, Kateri Little, who is your data coordinator for, uh -huh. your dist for our district, mm -hmm. has been phenomenal. And she is a, she's always one who pulls through for us and is actually helping us guide other districts on how to get the data that we need. So I just wanted to say she's been phenomenal. Um, and it's, we're absolutely delighted to be back out here and to meet all of you. We have never been before <laughs> an IFP 709 board meeting before. So thank you for having us. And thank you. Just spread the word. Let people know. I mean, I, this is this is what we're here for is to help students, and um, and we are proud to be a part of this district. And thank you for allowing us to come tonight. It looks like you had a pretty busy schedule, and so I appreciate you giving us the time. And and thank you again, Miss Opal, for helping me make this happen. So for well, 27 you. years, same with Kirsten. I yep. think it's probably been at least <laughs> I've been around between, 17 years. Yeah. So I'm not even <laughs> so, <laughs> right down the hall from me. And one of the things that I just always appreciated and was that um, I was a teacher that invited you into my classrooms because I taught ninth grade and that they needed to meet you. And when, when students meet the face that's asking or the announcement that's up there, and I, I just used to always work you into my curriculum and it was just, and it was always exciting for me to have you come in and, and do the presentation and, and share with our students. And so it's it's really, it's really been a part of just the journey to open up doors of opportunity for our students. And you know, and if I got a few on the speech team through you guys, you know, <laughs> yeah. we had an even yeah. exchange. So, um, yeah. no, but I want to say, we, at much again, we were writing our grant last year. Kateri was amazing to work with again for us That's too. Cool to but we, we don't know. have the success in our objectives. And we are not able to say that we've attained and, and exceeded all of our objectives without the support of our schools, of our principals, of our guidance counselors, of our teachers, of the paras, everybody who supports us has helped us reach the successes that we have with these students because we receive that support. So thank you so much. No, thank you. Yep. And thank you for you know offering this opportunity for our students. I mean, this is, uh, it's always has been uh, an important program mm -hmm. or programs for our students and so greatly appreciate it. Mm -hmm. And you have an open invitation for the spring or the summer, if you want to come and give us another update or share some information, please let us know. And I'm not just saying that because uh, this is really important. I'm excited just hearing about it because I, I was asking, like, hey, do we even offer these kind of programs? And here it is. We truly do offer them. And so it sounds like it's a lot of success and uh, greatly appreciate it. And if there are spaces or places where you're feeling like some, um, some opportunities exist in terms of getting and recruiting students, you know, I have a full team that can help uh, navigate some of those things with you in terms of uh, tapping on shoulders of families. We have our yeah. equity coordinator who is eager to assist if we are trying to identify additional students of color and uh, and reaching out to those families uh, and, and intentionally. Uh, we have those resources, so please use us uh, so that we can you. assist you. you. You know, maxing out your program. I want to. I want the seats to all be filled. <laughs> we do too. We do too. Yes. Thank you so much. I do appreciate that so much. Yeah, I have a quick question. First of all, thank you all so much. This is incredible. Um, and the tenure is incredible. Whether it's as a Duluth Public School graduate, Lisa, or um, Lisa and I played soccer together. Did not get in a foot race with her. Lisa um, was a student when I was at Central, so this tells you how long I've been here. I know. Um, so the question that I have is um, general, and I'm likely not going to say, I'm going to acknowledge my privilege when I, when I ask this question, but for students who have not thought of themselves as college just isn't in the forecast for, let alone college at a private university, what is the, like, how do you communicate, this is purely from my knowledge, but how do you communicate with students to help them um, see themselves as a college student like but like yeah. how do you because if I think if I had seen like I ruled out all private schools when I was in high school because I had we came from a lower income family so that was so I'm just curious like how you work with our students so sorry I immediately raised my hand because it. I was thinking of Maddie Henderman immediately um, so Maddie had a lot of energy and I'm not saying that energy was in the right direction. Uh, in fact, I think we could probably agree it was in a lot of the wrong direction. Um, but I went to her, Steph went to her, Amy went to her, they met one-on-one, -on -one, and then I came in and 
worked with her individually uh, throughout her, her high school career. And we just kept reminding her, you're a leader. And I kept telling her that. I'm like, you're a leader. You're meant to do something good. And you just need to like target that energy in a positive way. And I feel like the reminders of that and really honing in on their strengths, Steph in particular, she she works with the, the leaders, we call them Jelli, with Upward Bound. So they are a particular group of students that have that energy, but they need to correctly put it somewhere that's positive. And she worked with her, I worked with her, and she she did. She, she took off because she was consistently being reminded that we're here, we're watching, but we're rooting for you. And you can continue. Yeah. And I think better. it's, yeah, and I think no matter where you want to go, I mean, we work at the College of Saints Glasgow, that's where we're held. So you don't have to go there. Sure. We just That's a possibility. I mean, if it, you know, and we'll tell students in presentations, how many of you want to go to college? And some will be like, eh. I'm like, oh, that's okay. I said, some of you probably don't even know. You've never even thought of it. Maybe you want to go to Harvard. Maybe you want to go to Duke, University of Tennessee. Maybe you want to go to Harvard. Maybe you want to go to LSE, Fond du Lac, whatever that path may look like. Our job is to help you get there, fill out scholarships, be able to tell your story and articulate your story of who you are, where you come, your resilience, where you're going, what you're going to accomplish, no matter what the cost is. When we get to that, we'll look at the award letter. We'll look at it with your families. We'll compare. We'll contrast. If Scholastica's a fit, great. If Harvard's a fit, great. If you want to go to Spelman University, I'm a first student in Blue Central, Siobhan Smith, years ago. Yeah. I'm going as a freshman. I'm going to Spelman. I said. You want to go to Spelman? We're going to Spelman. We're going to get you to Spelman. When you cross that stage, I'm going to fly there and, and I'm going to be there. And I was. Yeah. And to this day, she comes back. She teaches up for us. So I don't care where you want to go, whatever that path is, we will make sure that we can get you there. By being in a college readiness program, there are scholarships out there just because mm -hmm. you're a part of our program. Mm -hmm. Sklaska gives $5,000. Ariana got the access scholarship just because she was in a college readiness, so free tuition. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. St. Olaf gives $15,000 yeah. if you're in a trio program. So there are opportunities that private schools will give, you know. And, and so we just like them to compare and contrast. I don't care where you go, just go. And do it well, be great, make us proud like you always do, whatever that is. So I think that's the big piece. And Maddie Hinder Hinderman is probably one of a thousand that you know, that just has taken it, and just by talking about college and knowing that it's a possibility, mm -hmm. that, and, you know, because they may not know that. If they're first generation, they may not talk about that. Right. So I know I, mine didn't. My parents didn't graduate from high school. I just knew that you graduated from high school and you went to college. That's just what you did. You did things in sequential order because life is hard, and that's why you do it, right? right. And I went to college and didn't have a clue. So I get it. I understand, and I, mm -hmm. and I like to be able to share some of my stories with them, you know, and just... I'm helping you prepare so you're not sitting in the back of the classroom when sister so-and-so asks you, what are you going to major in? You're like, I'm going to be a gym teacher. Yeah, we don't have that here. What are you going to do? I'm like, I don't know. What do you have? She's like, well, we'll figure this out. And I was like, I don't know. It's my first day. I don't know what I want to do. And you don't have it? So I get it. I've been there, you know, and navigated that scary process. But, I, think, yeah. I think for us, we start with sixth graders, and I find that really <laughs> exciting and rewarding because Bless just you. Exposing, <laughs> <laughs> exposing a sixth grader or a seventh grader or an eighth grader to college, it's stressful to bring a group of 36 <laughs> graders to college, um, but exposure. Exposure yeah, and letting good. them know the options are there. Um, I can't tell you how many of our Lincoln Park students, when we, when we drag them to, to UMD, didn't even realize UMD was there or hadn't been that far across town, especially when we were with Morgan Park many, many years ago, they're like, whoa, there's Canal Park, and, and just taking the students and exposing them mm -hmm. to different opportunities, whether it's here in their own community, and then we brought in, as they keep getting older, we keep brought in, broadening out to explore and expose them to more opportunities, and that's excitement, whether or not there's an ice cream machine at the cafeteria sometimes seals the deal, and that gets going there from <laughs> that point on. But yeah. I'd say exposure <laughs> and showing them that there's access. Awesome. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. I'll just give a, a quick update regarding our um, SRO um, community event and, and data sharing. As you know, one of the things that we wanted to accomplish was to have an opportunity for Manita's table to uh, share the results of 
all of the engagement opportunities that the community held uh, and the surveys that were given. And so we've been challenged with trying to find a date. And, and we were working on, uh, we had identified a December date, but uh, because of the uh, closeness to the holidays and because we, we recognize that staff uh, also need opportunities to, as we discussed earlier, to uh, just rejuvenate uh, and not have the, the pressure of such an event, uh, we looked for a, uh, a January date. Unfortunately, <laughs> January dates did, don't work because uh, the, the board, superintendent, and others will be at a conference uh, when Marnita Table was available. So now I received communication from that today, from them today, that now we are, they, they are looking at a February date, uh, early February date for the actual community presentation. So what I'll do is I will add um, in the superintendent's newsletter, because uh, today is on a Tuesday, it's half time. We, I'll add some information that will go out to the community for uh, regarding um, the SRO uh, update in terms of the status update for the community and letting them know where we are in our planning and where we are with the discussions. So that communication will go out to everyone uh, this Thursday or Friday with the superintendent's newsletter. And hopefully we will have a date identified uh, by then as well. Will Can you I be putting out, um, I, I'm sorry, Carol, yes. Uh, will you be putting out uh, a, a few different dates so board members can look yes. at that? Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. If I can quickly find my email while someone, I'll take someone's hand. Um, so just as I, I have the great fortune of sitting on the SRO subcommittee and just wanted to provide a little bit more information around why it's, it's a bummer that we have to push it out until February, but the, um, the ability to have Marnita's table um, fac facilitating not only the presentation, but also community discussions that follow it. Um, they are incredible facilitators. The data is fascinating. Um, some parts of it are surprising, some parts are not. Um, but we see, I saw language in there that where members of our community have an opportunity to learn how to talk about hard things like race and ethnicity and racism, um, to talk about it in a safe space where they can learn um, different um, methods of communicating how it is that they're feeling in a way that isn't offensive to their counterparts. Um, and so we thought it was really important to have uh, like a team from Marnita's Table be there and be able to help facilitate some of those discussions um, so that people feel safe and people have the opportunity to learn about how to have those crucial conversations as community members about important decisions that impact the school system, especially as we think about things like boundary studies. And um, so it's a good opportunity to model behavior um, and for folks to learn and to come together. So that's part of why we thought it was so important that um, that this be a full-fledged um, event. So like Anthony said, we had hoped we could do it tonight actually, but that obviously is, wasn't gonna work for a number of reasons. So. Um, I just want to thank Assistant Superintendent Bonds. Um, when you get a chance to look at the data, it's eye-opening, it's interesting, and through the selection of Marnita's table, I think that in and of itself was a critical um, positive step towards helping us get the outcomes we're looking to achieve as a district with this contract, but then also hopefully moving forward. So thanks, Anthony. I appreciate it. And I'll just put it out there now, which we still put in a doodle poll. They indicated today that um, the week of February 7th or the week of February 14th works for them at this time and they want us to um, can, you know you know to be solid on that uh, on those elections so we'll create a doodle poll and send it out to the board tomorrow uh, with those dates and then uh, we'll see where uh, so this 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 event this community mm -hmm. is is an opportunity for the board to be present but it, it won't be a board meeting and it won't be a place where we're expected to to dialogue it will this be I, I see it almost as um, almost some of the community boundary studies serve uh, meetings that came and um, school board members were invited I mean I think I hope we'll all be expected to be there but um, where it was really held for the community and for their for their um, for their conversation and, and for the presentation to happen 
That, so, that is correct. That is so, correct. It is more for the community, but we are trying to identify a time where we know yes, if the board yes, would like to yes, participate I, and, and uh, see the presentation and, and hear the presentation of the data and to then have an opportunity to go a little deeper into uh, learning about our SRO program. That's the intent, again, of the event. Uh, and, of course, there will be food and, and refreshments there as well. It's not the time where the board is going to make any decision at all. It's not a board meeting. There will be no decision. There will be no discussion on should we or shouldn't we keep our school resource officers or here's what we're going to do with our school resource officers. This is not that conversation. We're going to make sure that that's clear. This is a yes. presentation of the data mm -hmm. and another that's opportunity to uh, yep, and another opportunity to be to participate in small groups to just learn more about our school resource officer programs. Uh, of programming and to uh, and have a, have that facilitated by Marnita's table who does a phenomenal job of that and and again it's more about also just connecting the community in a, in a um, respectful way around a topic where through their engagement it's uh, the, the tension is uh, diffused it, it's really Oh, you've been you you've heard it uh, at one of them. So they, they do a really okay. masterful job at making sure that that tension isn't in the air and the conversation isn't one, even though it's a tough conversation, even though it's a talk of, topic of this a hard topic. Um, the environment isn't such where there's conflict, and so uh, we're really looking forward to having another opportunity for that kind of engagement um, and, and um, productive, you know, conversations around our school resource officer program. So again, not intended to, there's no voting, there's, it's not a meeting, no decisions will be made. I do just want to add, as the chair of the HR Finance Committee, we are a little over budget because we wanted to make this such an inclusive event leading up to this point. I think it's dollars very well spent, but I'll just say, um, I think that looking at continuing to engage with them as, and maybe even with other community groups as we tackle some common issues, um, I think would be a valuable investment on the part of the district. And I'd have to agree, if, um, having conversation with Marnita at the events um, and witnessing that the, the process of community engagement that, the, that Marnita has developed as her signature is worthy. Mm -hmm. And she, she encouraged us to reach out to mm -hmm. um, different granting organizations. They have found success in other communities by finding funding for that. Um, but that style of community engagement is is interesting and warm and inviting. Um, so I, I would agree. I would I, I don't think I need the data like tomorrow or anything, and I don't know what the subcommittee or the work that has been done, but I think it would be, at least I'm gonna speak for myself, that before the event in February, mm -hmm. to get some data a couple of days before we're gonna to come to a meeting and hear it. Okay. I would appreciate it. Like I said, I don't, I, I don't know what your what your what, what your thoughts are and what the subcommittee's work has been, but um, seeing the data before I hear it, mm -hmm. just as a way for me to come to the meeting um, with the idea I, that I have that background would be appreciated by me. I don't, mm -hmm. you know, I don't know if other board members feel the same or what is your thoughts, member? Yeah, Kinda? I think that um, I can certainly understand that. Um, of course, as they pulled up their presentation, I was wishing I could like flip through the slides, and I think they did maybe send it to us. Um, so, but the way that they present it actually changes the way that I received the information because they, as the facilitators, have intimate knowledge of of the genesis of whatever it is that they're talking about. And so, I would just, if you, I think it's totally valid. Um, but I, I would say go in with a very open mind um, because some of it is a little hard to read um, as being a community member of Duluth. Um, some of it is really uplifting, um, but I think allowing yourself to really hear it through their lens will be important. Also because they're, they're an outside facilitator, that lends some credence to the data. And then after, I think as of that date, right, they're gonna make our data it, which is de-identified publicly available on their website that was a part of our contract so the community will have the opportunity to look at it 
our folks will be able to slice and dice the data. Um, and I think it'll be really valuable as for your strategic planning and for some of the other initiatives that you have So we up. will have access to yeah. that data. Yes. Yeah. Excellent. I, I just think it'd be really important to have it at least the day before because we're going to be in a room full of, of community members. And when that data comes up, they're all going to turn and look at us <laughs> to see our reactions. And I, I want to be prepared for for the data, you know, I can read it. I can read a statement and wait for them to interpret it for me that's without fine. a problem. And that I think that's extremely valuable. Yep. No problem. Uh, and that's because good. I don't. I don't want to go. Oh my gosh, you know, or oh that's horrible, you know, and that kind of stuff. When, and when all the community's looking at at me and you know trying to gauge, oh, does she support them? Does she not? Does she, you know whatever it is. I just want to know what's going to be coming at me. No problem. Nobody and, knows and, how to school work number. You are, <laughs> must be super popular. <laughs> and, and that's the purpose of having it. It, it will be a, uh, identified as a board meeting to allow the board to all board members to participate. So that's why it's going to be listed as a, and I'll be working with, um, obviously, um, team to find out what kind of meeting it is, you know, we identify it as, but we'll work off the details on that so that all board members can participate. And yes, by doing that, yes, I'll share the data with you ahead of time. So I, I will have the data uh, shared with you ahead of time. And, Although, but just like that, we'll all have to be on a board. You know, I don't want it to go on the board book. And yeah. and okay. and yeah. I would have to take attendance. And <laughs> okay. Well. Someone can figure that out. Yeah. I yep, can. we'll figure that out. The other piece that I think is important is that it can be live streamed. Um, I think um, so as we're thinking about different locations, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, to have the community have the ability to be there in a safe environment, depending mm -hmm. on COVID numbers. Mm -hmm. But if we can think about using a space where you can live stream, because we had even talked about like, could we do chat or breakout rooms, some virtually and some in the room? Mm -hmm. Or, um, so I just think that it's good to, to make that, to make it um, acceptable. Yeah. Appreciate it. So we, we will figure out how to provide that information. And the last uh, topic on our agenda, um, Superintendent, are you going to add any additional information to your safe learning plan, or are you? Well, so actually, <clears throat> I had produced the slides prior to, you know, mm -hmm. in case there was a need to, to discuss the uh, calendar change. So most, uh, basically, the slides have already been shared. And so if there are additional questions, I'm glad to answer those. And I'm also glad to take topics for the uh, regular board meeting during my, my superintendent's report two weeks from now, if there's something more expansive that people would like me to elaborate on? Um, I think a couple things. One, I think highlighting and maybe finding a place to better list all of our partners. I thought what you talked about earlier about all the companies yeah. who are, and organizations who are showing up and saying, we want to support our educators and our staff. Finding some ways that we can be thankful for, th for them mm -hmm. is really great. Um, what is, I mean, if we look at our numbers, we're at, what, 109 point mm -hmm. something, which is four times where we were when we had school shut down. I understand there's a lot that's different. Like, what is the, what are the internal dialogues or the process for when the district, I know we talked about this in August, mm -hmm. but when do we know when it's time to send kids home for a while? Because mm -hmm. these numbers are alarming. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, part of it is the conversations related to you know preparation to ensure that we're ready for it as well, which the teaching and learning team has undertaken. I can I can share more about that at, at our uh, at our next board meeting. But as far as the metric that we use, that's something that there the state guidance that was there in place last year is not there this year. But the internal conversations, the conversations with Department of Health, quite often they've talked about. Uh, when we're reaching percentages of uh, similar to for, for flu or other other circumstances, those percentages are generally um, five to ten percent. Now, right now, we're closer to one percent as far as active cases. So, uh, as far as as far as the number of people that we've had, so there's still quite a ways to go from that pers perspective. But I I I'm hesitant to have a really hard metric because I, I think it's important for us to, to uh, listen to and rely on some of the guidance from, from the Department of Health and the County Department of Health when the spread rates are getting so high that we are uh, contributing to the problem of the community by holding school. 
that's that's a judgment for, for us as well that we need to undertake. So there isn't there isn't a hard metric number that we have, nor uh, other districts that I've talked to, other than uh, hearing five to ten percent. But we're not we're not close to to a five to ten five to ten percent uh, range at this point. I think it's important for us to continue that dialogue too as new variants come uh, onto the scene and what the spread rates are there. But it is a conversation that we, that we have uh, both internally and with external partners on a very regular basis, just as far as what, what are you doing, what are you thinking, and that would be um, what I'd lay out as far as kind of commonality of conversation amongst other districts. Well, I would say, um, you know, whether it's next week and you can, like last month you gave us a great, last month or two months ago, a great summary of Amy Westbrook's positioning on a couple of things. Um, just making sure that it continues to be a discussion topic at this table because we might have different perspectives as board members than, you know, Amy or others might have. And I, I think it's important that the board feel mm -hmm. like they're being useful mm -hmm. and are, in this process, so thank you. Sure. And uh, I'd just like to know exactly how much um, feedback you're getting from our hospital staffs. Uh, you know, I know that they were heavily involved last year, you know, yeah. in a big committee of, of, of discussions on how we're going to proceed, but are they as involved now? And, or have they reached out to you to say that, you know, it's time to shut, you know, no. is there a time to shut down that? They, they haven't come to that point. Uh, yet, but I think it's important to continue the dialogue. Uh, the Department of Education and Departments of Health have also said that it's important for us to remain in school for for the health factors that we have in place. So I'm, I'm it, it's that that catch twenty two of you know you you we, when we talked about all the things that will be missed earlier and when we were talking about two days being missed, if we're closed down for long periods of time, we have to think about those needs as well and what is what is impacted. But I do. I I take this very very seriously, and I hope hope you know that that this is probably the thing we wrestle with most and have the most internal and external dialogue around is how can we balance the safety needs and the learning needs, take into account the community considerations as well as the uh, recommendations. I think we've always tried to err on the side of of uh, being a little bit safety minded and, and, and a little bit cautious, but also pushing the point sometimes related to the student learning. So I appreciate the board's dialogue and, and input and, and relevance that you've had in the conversations. Oh, I'm sorry, you're not done yet? I just okay. had one more, one more question. Yeah. Um, in that um, today, you know, it, it was a breaking news from the DNT that the 98% of adult ICU hospital beds are full mm -hmm. in the state. And so, when you when we receive that kind of news from all of these external sources, and yet we were sending, you know, eight thousand students into school every day, is there a good way for us to be able to filter whether that need is going to come, or that we'll be able to see that need come? You know, it's like it's really hard to to know what to count on because you know when you see ninety eight percent. You know, I'm panicking because I'm like, you know, we got 1,400 staff, and, and they're if it, you know if they're not good, you know, if even 14 of them get sick, do they even have a place to go? No. You know, that sort of thing, and and I don't want to contribute to that health crisis in that way, or you know, put any of our staff in jeopardy, and so it's super hard to know what to do. And so I I can appreciate how you know you're conflicted, but um, is there any guidance you can give us on? On how to on what you're paying attention to and what we can pay attention to I guess sure that will help know when it's right <laughs> so I think the community spread aspect also looking at what are the what are the percentage numbers that we're actually seeing within the school and so so uh, maybe an update as well from uh, uh, crystal deal because right now, right now we're at, at just over one percent but of um, people who are ill with COVID within within the district, but that's still a pretty significant number. And we're talking hundreds and, and people. And that's of right those now. that report it too, not, I'm sure not everyone's reporting. That's, that's an important factor too. I read a story, I think there's so much, like I, we, all of us are probably reading, reading 10, 15 articles a day about, about COVID, about the, 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 the changes. I think it's important for us to uh, continue to push the conversation 
between the Department of Education and the Department of Health, so that we have, it, you know, it might, it won't, it won't be mandated, but there should at least be some some clear guidance in in what should be considered. And I think that there's there's growing hesitance on the part of some of the the, the entities to make any sort of recommendation, even a recommendation to districts. So it, it, it is important for us collectively and for me to, to rely on the board as uh, as well through informing informing you based on what, what we know, but also taking your uh, uh, your guidance from from a from a uh, from a uh, perspective of representing the community. What is right for our community? Um, do we have a distance learning plan that we could pull back to, um, mm -hmm. whether it would be for a week or two weeks? And you know, last year at this time, mm -hmm. all of our grade levels were in, in distance learning. Uh, when our numbers were were going, maybe maybe they're actually about half of what they are right now. But some, but it made a difference. And, and so after that holiday break, and when we, we were able to get all of our kids back in school in full. Uh, in January, even prior to vaccination, mm -hmm. do we have a distance learning plan that we could? We do, and I think it, that would be a, a great topic for the superintendent's update uh, when when I share it. But but uh, Mr. Bonds and the teaching and learning team, working with the principals, they they do have uh, it's it's a plan developed that, that takes it beyond what we've done previously. So there there are plans for being able to. Uh, work on distribution of devices, making sure that we have, have the hot spots, making sure that we have uh, opportunities and, and layout for, for what instruction looks like. Those are things that, that uh, have have been, it wasn't as though they weren't developed, but they've been further refined because, you know, if it's, if it's a, you know, at the beginning of the school year, the Department of Education and the Department of Health said, you're going back to normal, don't worry about anything, mass, you know, Figure it out from there, but as we're as we're seeing things become more of a, I, I don't even want to necessarily say it's a, it's a it's a possibility, but we should be really well prepared no matter what. It's like it's like having one of those safety ladders in your second floor bedroom. You hope you're never going to use one of those one of those one of those ladders, but you sure as heck want to make sure it's there. Same token, I think it's important for us to make sure that we have a robust. Uh, sorry. Uh, We're just jump in. We're just jumping. Uh, I, okay, I don't have a ladder in my room either. But there is a little thing I can jump out of. No. But um, and I had a neighbor who broke his broke his back climbing out from a fire boot sheet. So maybe that's why I think about safety ladders. Anyway, it's getting late, I guess. The it is important for us to make sure that we're well prepared for any eventuality. That's all I mean to say. So um and, and I saw the 98% in the Star Review mm -hmm. article that, that came out earlier, and then the Zeus News crew picked it up. Um, yeah. What I'm concerned about, well, locally, and we've heard from our local hospitals about where their status are, are with just beds available, not even ICU beds. I mean, are, are they at capacity or near capacity? <clears throat> so I did have a conversation this morning with representatives from. Essentia. They have not started the, the last year. They had multiple, like the future forecasting uh, meetings on a regular basis. They have not restarted those, uh, but there wasn't there wasn't any any mention of need or, or, or press from Essentia when I talked to them. But I think it would be good for us to reach out to them prior to uh, the next meeting or or perhaps sooner, so that we can. I mean, I, I'll reach out to them sooner. But and I if there's if there's a concern from from the medical community, from St. Luke's and Essentia, that we that there's a request or a need for us to be more uh, conservative and safety minded. I would more than uh, I would I would want to make sure that we move in that direction. I I can make sure that the uh, what I can do is I can reach out and hopefully include information in my my weekend board update so that you have have information there. And if there are other needs for more pressing conversation, we can do that. They've been pretty. Uh, quick to tell us when when there is a, a case for alarm, and we've had a lot of dialogue, and I haven't heard that that request yet. But it doesn't doesn't mean that it's not there, and maybe they're too busy 
taking care of their situation that they haven't haven't informed us. But I think it's good for us to reach out and have that dialogue. I think we're all well aware that their staff yeah. are also stressed. Yeah. And, yeah. And there's a lot less of them. I think that that's part of going back to what Member Oswald asked around like what data points should we be looking at? So if we're looking at ICU bed capacity in Minnesota, it's at 98 percent. Well, part of that is because we have patients coming in from Colorado, Montana, North and South Dakota. Um, so that's not necessarily representative of the region. Um, so we might be at 90% capacity here, but it's in part because none of the Iron Range hospitals, for example, have any ICU beds that are full because most of those hospitals are eight beds or less. So, um, so I think it's helpful to know, and maybe Dr. Pryor or somebody, or Amy or somebody else could give us some guidance around, we it, it's a problem. It's a huge problem that we're at 98% of our ICU bed capacity, but um, is that what data sets should we be considering? Um, and how do we look for that? To member Oswald's point, to help us make more informed decisions. Because, you know, public trans community transmission is one of the data indicators you want to look at. Well, where's the best place to get that information? Um, I just think maybe a little like cheat sheet or rubric or something while not making any formal recommendations or setting it as a clear um, process or you know stop point, but helping the board feel confident that we have the appropriate information to be asking the right questions, pushing potentially for decisions from administration, and certainly communicating with the community. Can I just trip in before that too about, I mean, I think some of it, and maybe you could re recover this again next in our board meeting, is the, the spread within a classroom or within a school building is kind of our data point. And I think that you've got clear metrics as to yeah. when that has to happen and you yes. then um, shared those decisions with us. Trends. But re re con reconnecting us to those data decisions when a classroom or when a school building. Mm -hmm. The other thing, and, and I've had conversation with Superintendent Magus um, a time or two that, you know, I think our community and our board might want more of that um, dashboard kind of feature, but I also know that it's, it's hard. We're just not, we don't have the staff. We've been trying to fill in with Crystal Deal with some support staff, and you haven't been we able to hire. We were actually able to hire somebody, oh, so we, did. we have filled that position. Okay. And okay. so with that extra capacity, I think that there are some things we can do. I can work with uh, Mr. Bonds and, and Jason Crane overseas, uh, Crystal, but I work with Crystal on, we, we, we yeah. talk a couple Probably. times a day at yeah. least, and uh, we can make sure that we're, we're uh, able to, to update that dashboard. But I think too, Knowing what metrics we want on our dashboard, what makes the most yeah. most sense. I do think you're 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 all right that that the spread within the classroom and spread within the school and spread within the community are the three the three level criteria that we yeah. generally look at um, most closely. And you've had a system of that, Pardon? right? You know, you. I, I have regular conversations yeah. with Crystal about our current rates here in the district. Regular conversations with. Uh, Aubrey Mackey Hoover about yeah. the, the the community rates. Because Amy um, Westerbrook isn't there anymore. Right? Amy is there, but okay. but Amy uh, has a, has a somewhat different role. Yeah. Okay. And Aubrey is more of the the main person. It was right. uh, Sarah Miller for a while, and we hired her. There actually are two Sarah Millers that, that <laughs> work. There's Sarah Miller, the county person who is now our nurse, and then there's a Sarah Miller from Essentia who sets up um, a lot of the the testing and vaccination oh, events. So. Okay. That, that might cause some, some confusion there. But I think it's important for us to uh, have that clear information out. I would, um, we, I also have weekly conversations with the AMSD superintendents and we're frequently having, they're talking about, you know, potential closure, what are we looking at, what are we considering, as well as the regional superintendents. But I think being able to distill that down into what are the, the factors would be something uh, to consider. That that will require quite a bit of preparation. So, um, and, and I'm also trying to work on the supports for the additional days and, and uh, those factors too. So I do want to see see what I can do within the next within the next week week and a half to, to get that. But I think having the preliminary conversation with the board, because if you don't have a if you don't have a dashboard, then you're driving blind, right? And it's important for you to have that opportunity. 
Well, even if it's not a dashboard, but here are the three places we would recommend you go where all this publicly available data is and, already there. And I, and I think that will only help if and when we you come to the point where you think you have to mm -hmm. go hybrid, go distance, whatever it, whatever it means. When you when you have to implement change, I have implement change. Yes, I can speak. Um, <laughs> that that the more knowledge we have prior to that, the the less you know questions we'll have when it happens, mm -hmm. and and we can offer our, our support more. Than, I appreciate it very like, much. Like, huh? Why not? Right, right now, I think yeah. Yeah. so. We have a whole group of elementary schools coming on that they're elementary school students that they're going to have their full immunity, and we have a plan where when we see spread in classrooms, we shut classrooms down and we shut schools down. Mm -hmm. I'm really struggling to think of a situation where you would use a blunt force like shutting a district down mm -hmm. because we have a different situation. Mm -hmm. So I, I just want to be very clear, like we have a plan in place where when we see spread in schools, we make sure that we are isolating classrooms and individuals and buildings. Mm -hmm. But that whole blunt like right. of just Thank shutting you. a district down that's that's a that's a huge. long ways mm -hmm. off and yeah. it's not something that is is on our immediate horizon and i think yeah i just want that to be very that. clear like i'm Thank all you. for the planning piece but we have i just yep good point yeah and, and there I was state that, guidance that guided us to that so when the yeah. emergency uh response was in the governor's plan or state's plan had some real detailed information on when the school had to go into yeah. a closure, when a district had to go into either hybrid or full closure again. So that is no longer the case. We are in a different space. And, and the last thing uh, is that we're, we're spending a lot of our energy on mitigation efforts, such as the clinics and the testing and making sure you know people are masking up. So we're, we're spending a lot of energy on trying to make sure we, we make sure people are uh, in a better situation. And, and right now, our primary data is what's happening in our buildings. And so we know right now we are at about 1% across the district. We're concerned about that, but you know, which, which is why we have already started the planning and having things in writing on what will we do, let's say if the state said, okay, you have to do something, or if the state never says it, but we have significant spread and we need to, as a district, decide you know, it goes up to 20% and we decide that we might want to consider that, that we would be ready to, to flip the switch on that. But we, do we have any idea about what the vaccination rates of our staff and our students look like? Or are we just blind? Because you can't really make we, we do a decision have, about shutting a whole district down mm -hmm. until you have an idea of what vaccination rates. No, I do have like. information on vaccination rates. And so that, I mean, that would be one of the critical sure. pieces. Mm -hmm in there would be that those mm -hmm. vaccination rates. It's not wonderful. It's about 25% for our five to 11 year olds. That's not bad. And 40% and ish for the, and this is just in the Duluth area, 12 to uh, 18, the 12 to 17 year olds is about 40, 45%. But what does our staff data look like? But it's better. The staff data I can get for you as well. Yeah, I, I mean, the, you know, I don't need, it's just like those are pieces of data that would have to be mm -hmm. taken into consideration. I just want, we have to be very clear. We don't need people all of a sudden saying, oh, Duluth Public Schools is deciding right. this. I would say that that, it, yeah. that is not uh, under consideration at this point in, in that respect. It's just preparing for the future. And as a reminder for our policy committee meeting on Thursday, uh, because of the presidential order, there is a mandate for uh, vaccination for a Head Start uh, individuals, and so a mandate for uh, yeah. vaccination or testing, and so we're going to be having some conversation on on policy awesome. related to that. Uh, there. Do you have the policy oh, written I've... yet? It's in draft in draft form. Is right it? Now. Okay. Yep. We're just not working on it. Okay. Sorry about that. No, that's okay. I have two things to say. So on that, isn't Minnesota? Don't we fall under the injunction that was filed in the southern the case in in mm -hmm. southern Louisiana? So we don't have to because. The final rule is has been put on hold for the school system as a whole, or as a whole, <laughs> yes. But the federal Head Start right. program falls into a different category. So okay. that's so, where it's it's like great. everything is paused, and then all of a sudden the court said Head Start can go ahead, and we can we can require it for Head Start. So you need a policy. They did change the deadline to uh, January thirty first yeah. for January thirtieth thirty first for for when people have to be vaccinated by, but that's why it's important for us to write that. And uh, Teresa Severance and Sherry Williams have been and the rest of us have been working on on that policy uh, that that we would share a, a draft of it at the uh, 
at the policy committee meeting for, for conversation. Okay, so my second piece is going back to what Member Eater said. I really respect you clarifying the language. Um, I think, however, that and this goes back to asking for data, as a parent, I don't know what to do, you know, because I get information. So I think providing, like, providing our community with information on here's where you should go. We've had three instances where we've gotten the email that said your child has been in close contact, and we don't know what to do always as a family because we don't, because there, because we don't know what's going on in the building. We don't know exactly what's necessarily going on in the community. Do we err on the side of caution? And I think about our student representative, Stella, last year, who had a parent who was significantly medically compromised. And how does a person like Stella, what would she have done if, we, if she was going to school this year? So I think we need to be thinking about it, not just, you know, I think we have to think about giving our families proactive information, or at least giving them a place to go so that I'm not texting the superintendent <laughs> to say, I don't know what to do. Yeah, sure. <laughs> so, I, I know a parent that has gotten notices for 22 days in a row that his child was exposed so and he doesn't know what to do with them uh, yeah I mean we absolutely it, it is con it is confusing and it is scary um, I completely respect all that but we have to make sure that we're clear in our messaging so that we don't contribute you know that we, that we have scary. a steady yeah yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. When you get the notification, could there be a link to where you should go for the update as to? Yeah, I think there, there is. There, there is, is, there is yeah. but there is like, here's the protocol that you're supposed to follow, yeah. whether or not it's, we don't, yeah, I don't think it's being followed oftentimes, which does, but yeah. if for, for me and I work in healthcare and I am on the second line of doing a lot of this work and I still don't know what to do with our kiddo because there's just a lot that we don't know, which is fine because we love FERPA and HIPAA and that's all really important. I just think that we can provide support so that we're not contributing to the chaos. Um, we're not help, we don't want people to fear that we're going to go into lockdown. Yes. That's a really important point. Mm -hmm. Everything else feels uncertain right now. Let's keep mm -hmm. our kids in buildings. But how do we give people a source for relevant information? Yes. So they can make their own decisions. Absolutely. Great. And I think I agree. And I think that uh, we had been seeking to hire that that support for Crystal mm -hmm. that will assist with some of the, the clarity communication. I also think about Katie Kaufman's uh, position and the work that's done between those two positions. And with Katie retiring, we need to think about our, our communication structures there as well. So making sure that, that we have uh, clarity of, 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 uh, of flow of information for parents who are in, in need there is really critical. I agree. Couldn't the community partners that we have, couldn't we come up with some kind of a hotline number and, and yeah, it be manned that. by someone that would be able to answer all of these school children's I think, I types of things? It's pretty hard to, even even the people that are consistently working at on it, to have consistency in recommendation yes. because of yeah, things being so yeah. different. I mean, like Crystal yeah. and I are kind of troubleshooting with Jason and, and, uh, and Aubrey on a near daily basis about different situations as far as, okay, true. so we've got a basketball team with this, or we've yeah. got three yeah, people with that, or it stop it would never stop The ringing. easiest thing for people to do is get vaccinated, get your family yes. vaccinated. That takes a huge load off of worrying when you get these notices, is when, the, when you're members of your family and you are vaccinated, that makes a huge difference in protection of you and your community. And Duluth Public Schools is doing awesome. We're yep. offering yes. clinics, we're doing those things. I'm I would super agree, proud of us. and I would say, to, to also toot the horn of the, the administration and, and, and school board, we we have um, what we did tonight was was pretty innovative in the way that we set up the two extra days with, with the input from a lot of people and from learning from others who had moved forward. Your approval of that to focus on booster clinic and and uh, the vaccine test or the uh, testing afterwards is has been important. The, your support of the uh, clinics for the five to 11 year olds was something that was groundbreaking. We we're some of the first in the country and the news stories about that are actually, you know, in Egypt and Spain and being, you know, Duluth Public Schools, if you search it, you'll, you'll mm -hmm. find uh, news stories around the world about the, the clinics we had. And that's because of 
the forward thinking of, of our, our leadership team. Do we have a ways to go on a lot of things? And is there still a lot of things that feel very unclear and uncertain? Very much so. But I, I, the same dedication that you've shown in leading us through that and that our schools and teams have shown towards it, we're going to dedicate towards towards the unknowns that are before us. And all that will be answered in more in the superintendent's <laughs> update. <laughs> you you better start of, writing it now. No, seriously. Right. Speaking of giving people a break so that they don't have to spend all of this time, yeah. you know, <laughs> listening for our pontification. Agenda for today. Thanks, Anthony. Thank you, Anthony. Yeah, thank you. Well, we don't have we to adjourn. No, I no. will just give us a lot. Yeah. 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 Good to see you.